Tonight we spoke about dreams, why we dream, the benefits of dreaming, what happens if you have a negative dream, why negative dreams come, what we're supposed to do with them, and how we're supposed to make sure it doesn't happen again. Hope you'll be able to join. This is always something that people have such an interest in, which is explaining dreams. What's going on when we dream? How are we supposed to view dreams? What are we supposed to do about them? So stop me at any moment if you have any questions or anything to, to add, to interject, to comment on. Um, because as I said, you know, this is always something people have, you know, we dream. So we have a high, uh, a high interest in understanding what's really going on. So when we're looking at dreams, and this is very interesting because Hasidus said this some 150 years ago, and probably 50 plus some years ago, two people won the Nobel Prize for coming up with a sort of similar theory, one that Tyra knew long before them. So what is the function of dreams? So the function of dreams is to help us. Dreams clean the toxins of the day, meaning whatever we absorb, all the randomness, not something bad, just all the stimuli, all the stuff that we pulled in all day long. It's in our mind, it's in our soul, and we shake it out and discard it as we dream. So I envision it like a shake and bake bag. They have all the stuff shaking there and then psh, it all comes out. And for that reason, the dream is a very good thing to strengthen and clean the mind and strengthen and clean the soul. And that's why our sages say that if someone doesn't sleep, they are called a Russia. Why are they called a Russia if they don't sleep? Because if they don't sleep, they can't dream. And if they don't dream, their mind and soul are clogged up with all of this debris, with all of this junk that they didn't get rid of. Now, I'm sure you've noticed this phenomena. If ever you're, you know, functioning on like very little sleep, that you really aren't sleeping properly at night at all. And you can take like a little doze, not deliberate sometimes, just fall asleep cat nap for 5, 10, 15 minutes. And when you wake up, you can't believe it was such a short time because you had such, you had so many dreams. Like your dreams are so vivid. There's no way I could have dreamt all that in 15 minutes. But that's literally what's happening. Because, okay, now that you're sleeping, we got to utilize the time to, to dream away all these stuff. And that's why we can sometimes, especially as I'm saying, if you're not getting enough sleep, you can see when you, when you dream in this little amount of time you have to sleep and you can feel the intensity of those dreams. And that's for that reason. So therefore... According to the sages, according to Tyra, dreams are very positive. Dreams are a good thing. And dreams help us. Now, people sometimes say, but I don't remember my dreams. And that concerns them, especially when we start talking about dreams and all the symbolisms of dreams. And they're like, but I don't remember my dreams. Don't worry if you don't remember your dreams. There's no injunction that one has to remember their dreams. We're going to talk about some special dreams. And sometimes people have a fear. Well, what if I have one of those really cool, special, amazing dreams and I don't remember it? It doesn't work that way. If you had such a dream, which is obviously a message to you from on high, you're going to remember it, even though you never remember any of your dreams. But there are definitely, definitely people who have no memory of their dreams whatsoever, night after night. But trust me, all this is happening. All of the debris of the day, all of the toxins, all of the randomness is all getting discarded from your system, from your mind, and from being clingy. We're told it sort of clings to your soul, getting detached from clinging to your soul as you dream. All right, so that's a regular dream. But sometimes we have negative dreams. And sometimes we have very positive dreams. So we'll start by talking a little bit about the negative dreams. And then we'll talk more about the very positive dreams. But if a dream doesn't fall in either of these categories, it's not a negative dream. And it's not a very positive dream. Again, it is still a very positive thing for you 
cleansing your mind, cleansing your soul. And every time you sleep, it happens and you don't have to remember it. That's not needed for to cleanse everything. All right. So we said we're starting with the negative dreams. If you wake up and you had a very fearful dream, which happens sometimes, you can and should, if the dream concerned you, fast. Now, this fast is very different legally than any other fast in Judaism. Because in the Jewish tradition, we have certain fasts that all of us fast. They're injunctive by our sages. They're obligatory. We have the four fasts for the destruction of the temple. We have Yom Kippur, of course, from the Torah. We have Tom Gedalia. We have Tainus Esther. So those seven fast days, we all have to fast. Let's say you wanted to take on an optional fast. Well, why in the world would you want to fast if you don't have to? Uh, maybe for tshuva. Maybe you want to repent for something you did that was very, very wrong. And fasting is a very strong tool of repentance. So can you just wake up in the morning and then you were so busy, you didn't get anything in your mouth, not even a sip of water until way after nightfall, you know, until six o'clock in the winter. You fasted the whole day. Does that count? No, it doesn't count at all. Why not? Because for a fast to be a religious spiritual fast, nowadays people like this intermittent dieting, fasting. No, for it to be a real deal spiritual fast, you have to take it upon yourself the day before. Generally, the time to do it is actually during the Mincha prayer, a specific place in the Mincha prayer, there's a specific thing one can say. Or if you don't know what to say, you could just say those words that you take upon yourself tomorrow a fast. You could take upon yourself a half day fast, you take upon yourself an entire day fast. Sometimes if maybe someone is very sick, you wanna fast to ask Hashem to heal them, or if there's some bad calamity going on in the community, or as I said, for personal repentance, tshuva, there's various reasons why people want to fast. And for it to count as a fast, as God is counting a fast, doesn't mean you didn't eat and drink, you must take it on the day before Mincha time. Except the fast here. We, I didn't forget that we are talking about dreams, but I wanted to bring it in for you to understand. This is called a tainus chalom, a fast because of a dream. You're fast because of a bad dream. So this is the only fast in Judaism that you do not have to take on the day before at Mincha. You actually can't possibly take it on the day before at Mincha because you're not going to know you're having a bad dream that night. So in the morning when you wake up, you decide you're going to fast because of concern over the dream. And if there was anything negative in it, you want to absolve it with your fasting. Let's say when you woke up in the morning, you know, like sometimes happens, you don't even remember your dream. So your life proceeded as your life. If you start with a cup of coffee or, or oatmeal, cereal, whatever. And a few hours later, you suddenly triggered, something triggered you and you remember this horrible dream you had. Well, you can't fast today, you already ate. So you'll fast tomorrow. No, you cannot do that. The only time you're able to fast for a dream is that day and that day only. So again, it's the only time we don't establish it the day before. But that morning when you wake up, you have to take upon yourself that you're not eating or drinking this day. It's a fast to absolve any negativity of your dream. And it's the only day you have that opportunity. Eliza, what's your question? I thought we're supposed to always see our dreams for the good, even if they don't seem good to us. So then how are we then fasting for what is a nightmare, basically? You absolutely are supposed to, as, as I'm going to say in a minute or two. But sometimes people are nervous. People are scared. And they really want to do something to, if there is any, they're going to try to interpret it for good as well, of course. But they also want to fast because something in it really disturbed them. So you're allowed to fast at the same time interpreted for good. I know that might sound um, like Judaism, you know, <laughs> containing all, all opposites, all things that seem contradictory just work beautifully together. The more you understand, the more we see how it all works together. So yes, we are supposed to interpret it for good. And at the same time, again, there's now, let me clarify.
There's not an obligation to fast. If you wake up and remember this very terrifying dream, there's no obligation to fast. But if you choose to fast, this is how you can. But there's no obligation to. And if you get it interpreted for good and feel very calmed and comforted and have no desire to fast, beautiful. Like, that's fine. No need. Um, so going to what Elisa was saying, we have a rule. We learned this rule from Yosef and his dreams. The rule of our sages is dreams go according to the interpretation. As we see in the Torah, that when Yosef had those dreams, he wanted, sorry, I just dropped here. He wanted it interpreted. He went to his brothers to interpret his first dream and they did. He went to his brothers to interpret the second dream and they didn't. They were like, we're not going to fall into that trap again. We're not going to interpret his dreams for him. So then he went to his father to interpret his second dream. So dreams go according to the interpretation and therefore you want your dreams interpreted. Their dreams always go according to the interpretation, but most of us wouldn't bother unless it's a dream that concerns us. So you could really get any dream interpreted. Obviously, when Yosef got his dreams interpreted, they were very good dreams. So it doesn't mean you need it to be a bad dream to be interpreted, but we generally go or ask someone if we have a dream that concerns us. So if you have what we'll call a scary dream, a concerning dream, go to someone who is wise and caring to interpret it for you. Now, if they don't know what you're talking about, you can explain to them the concept. <laughs> and this comes straight from the Gemara, very legit source, very authoritative. In the Gemara, there's a very, very long story of two, when I say story, I do not mean not true, a happening of two sages, two Amoraim, two sages of the Talmud, very strong, detailed story of the two of them that both had this crazy dream one night, same night. They both dreamt the exact same dream. And the first Amira goes to this famous dream interpreter of the city. And being that he was a little street savvy, he knew to give him a nice gift. And he told him this whole dream with all of its details. And he interpreted everything beautifully and positively and wonderfully. And everything he said happened. Shortly after him, the second Amora came to the dream interpreter, but he wasn't he wasn't as street smart. So he didn't know you're supposed to bribe the guy to give you a good interpretation. He just knew this is the person you go to interpret your dreams. So he went, he had this very strange, concerning dream. He shares the whole dream with all of the details, exactly like the dream of the other Amoira, but he didn't pay him anything for it. And the dream interpreter was so upset with him that he gave him a horrible interpretation, many bad things, and everything he said happened. And this brought in the Talmud to flesh out the point they're saying that dreams go according to the interpretation. You cannot interpret it for yourself. That is actually the reason why, if you've ever noticed, when we have Birchas Kayanim, when we have the priestly blessing, the passage that we read as the priests are blessing us speaks about dreams. And the reason is because it used to be in biblical times that people would go to the priests, to the kohanim, for their dream interpretations. So that's why we link the blessing of the priests with this idea of asking God that all our dreams should be good. So if someone comes to you because they trust you, because they think you're wise, because they think you're caring to interpret the dream, again, what you, what you generally want to do is obviously has to fit some way into the dream but always, always, always look for the good. Well, maybe that's not what was meant by it. Maybe it was really, it doesn't make a difference what was meant by it. A dream goes according to the interpretation. So it's irrelevant what was meant by it. At this moment, your interpretation is refashioning it into this very positive, very beautiful, positive concept. That's if you have this random negative dream that really scares you, you fast or you don't. You go to someone to interpret it so you know it's all going to be good. If it is a recurring negative dream, 
meaning it keeps coming again, the same dream, it keeps coming again, the same dream. Then you want to work a little harder. You want to check, is there some force of evil in the room or in the home that's a magnet that's attracting this negative energy and that's why this evil keeps coming at you. Um, there's a famous Hasidic story of a man whose father, and this goes back to the times of the Vilna Gon, uh, that his father kept coming to him at night after he passed away and kept telling him to convert to Christianity. And the man was totally spooked out. I'm like, he's like, what's going on? I mean, you know, he knows that's not the truth, but why is his father, once he's in, so to speak, I love him as the world of truth, telling him about Christianity, what is going on? And, you know, he, he didn't know what to do. And he was very, very, very scared and very concerned. He didn't, he didn't want to go to sleep at night because, you know, he didn't want to put himself in a situation where he's going to have this horrific dream. But, you know, obviously you sleep. And it kept coming again and again and again, this, this very, 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 very bad dream. And he didn't know what to do. And he was speaking to his friends and they said, fast, give stuck up, you know, all these different things to take on yourself, which he did and didn't help. His father kept coming. And finally, they told him to go to the Vilna Gon. And then he went to the Vilna Gon. The Vilna Gon also said such ideas and he did them and it didn't help. And then someone told him to go to this Hasidic Rebbe the um, Hasidic Rebbe, who was, just a second, for some reason, I'm having a, a senile moment, as we say. I totally forgot the name, though I definitely know who this is. Um, I cannot remember his name. Very interesting. Okay. I'm not meant to share the name. If it comes to me like a few minutes, I say, oh, someone, so that's what I'm talking about. Anyway, it doesn't make a difference. He goes to this Hasidic Rebbe and who was known sort of as like holy, but people viewed him as an ignoramus and whatever. And um, he told him what's happening, you know, out of desperation. And the Rebbe said to him, when your father was buried, a piece of wood broke off the casket and fell on his body in a cross. So you have to open up the casket, remove that piece of wood, that splinter of wood, and all will be fine. And he was like, oh, wow, this is Zusha, from Zusha von Apoli. So, um, so after listening to Reb Zusha von Apoli and having no choice, of course, this is very terrifying to open up a grave, but he did it with some people. And there was on the father's body, a wood had splintered off in the shape of a cross. They removed it and the dream stopped. And the story goes, that eventually that everybody was talking about this, this, this crazy, amazing thing to the degree that the news went back to the Vilna Gaon, who was involved in the incident. And the Vilna Gaon said, he, when he heard that, he said, you know, actually that's true. That's what it says in the Talmud Yerushalmi. But Zusha, Zusha, Vanapoli, everyone knows he's a complete ignorant. How in the world does he know what's written in the Talmud Yerushalmi? And when the Vilna Gaon's comment reached Reb Zusha, as these things have a tendency to do, Rav Zusha said, the Vilna Gaon is completely right. Zusha is an ignoramus. Zusha didn't see it in the Talmud Yerushalmi. Zusha saw it in the same place where the Talmud Yerushalmi saw it. So it's a very, very powerful story. Again, bringing out this concept, which by you might not be as dramatic, but I have been involved in some stories where literally people do find things like that in their homes when there is... Um, things like these recurring evil dreams and things like that, that you would say, there's gotta be some reason for it. There's gotta be some magnet. There's gotta be something going on that this evil keeps attacking me night after night. Now, to protect yourself, well, to protect yourself from being, now the reason why, let me go back a step. The reason why we need the protection I'm about to say and the reason why you can get attacked like this at night is because in general, when we sleep, we are very, very susceptible. We're very susceptible. In a sense, sometimes we're more susceptible to, to holy messages because we're sort of open, but we're 
very susceptible to evil because when we sleep, a tremendous portion of our soul leaves our body every single night. Every single night when we sleep, the majority of our soul leaves our body for two purposes. One, to be cleansed, and two, to be judged. There is a judgment every single night. There is a far bigger judgment once a year, or Shana and Yom Kippur. There's, of course, the ultimate judgment when someone passes away, but there is a nightly judgment. It's interesting, this nightly judgment, I mean, just it's a little parenthetical, but since we're talking about it, on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, your year is decreed, including all the great goodness you're supposed to get because you did such a good job, you repented, you fasted on Yom Kippur, you gave loads of staka, you davened, you did everything you were supposed to do so beautifully. So this gorgeous, great, beautiful year was recorded for you. But every night you're judged. <laughs> and the judgment of that day determines Will the good that was decreed in that book of life, the high holiday season, is it going to come down as we understand things in a physical dimension? Or are you going to receive it only in its spiritual reality? Now, obviously, receiving something good is good, and receiving something good in a spiritual reality is also good. But we also like it in the physical dimension, you know, nachas from children, children, health. Parnassa, all the brachas, all the blessings, we like to see them with our own physical eyes. And that's what we're told, that that nightly judgment is really determining if the good is going to come down physically or only spiritually. So well, getting back to what we're talking about here, that's why you're more susceptible because you don't have the protection of your soul because the high majority of your soul has left you. That's also the reason why when we wake up in the morning, right away, we wash our hands ritually, what we call negovasar. It's very, very important actually to have by your bedside a washing basin and some type of bucket that you only use for this purpose. You do not use it for anything else. Probably basin is a better word than bucket. And we wash that also right there by the bedside. And the reason we do so is because since the majority of your soul left you, evil has sort of extended itself over your body. And when you wake up and your soul comes back, the evil leaves your body through the fingertips. And therefore we wash ritually. First thing we do after Modani is we wash ritually before we even leave our bed to remove this evil because we don't want it to have any ability to, to harm us. Any questions, anything I've said so far? All right. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is it possible, my, my daughter had a nightmare um, and she came in our room crying and she said her nightmare was that she was killed in the Holocaust. She actually saw herself being killed. Is it possible to have dreams like that where you're actually, where you, where you personally actually die? Could one have such a dream? Why not? I don't know. I feel like. Usually if you think of someone else passing away, if they're going to do that. What, say that again, I'm sorry. Are you saying that usually you would think in a dream if you have the symbol of death, it's with someone else and you're watching someone else. Yes. That's not your own. Yeah, you know, a person a person could dream that they passed away. It, now again, it's with such a dream. My question would be: Was she reading about the Holocaust, learning about the Holocaust, saw a movie about the Holocaust? Was there anything there that would trigger that? Probably, yeah. Her class did a project on it. Yeah. Okay. So maybe it was on her mind. That that would make perfect sense. It was on her mind, and I would reassure her, and I would tell her that you know what you. Think about by day sticks, because I want to understand it's not a negative thing. It sticks to your brain. It's like little leeches clinging to your brain and to your neshama. And a way that we detach these things that are clinging and clogging up our brain, like just clogging up the clarity of our thought and clogging up our soul, like the pores of our soul, is by dreaming. So everything we think about and process by day, even if you're not aware of it, even if it's subconscious, is clinging to our mind, clinging to our neshama, and we have to dream to like get rid of it. 
So probably because you did this project in class, even if it wasn't that day, but it might have been subconsciously in your mind. And of course, the Holocaust, there's a lot of death that you have to talk about or think about or discuss. So this was really Hashem's way of helping you. This dream was really a way of helping and detaching from that. So I know it's scary. I mean, obviously she was scared, she's probably younger, but it's, it's actually Hashem's help. And if she accepts that, I would move on with that. If, if she's like, no, but it was a really bad thing, then I would say, okay, so let's, let's talk about what we have as a positive interpretation. You're really teaching her a skill for life. Because when we have a dream that concerns us, we want to have someone else interpret it positively. Thank you. One more question. I also heard that if you, if you dream of someone, if you dream of someone dying, you see someone in your dream dying, that you add life to them. Is that, or is that oh, Baba Misa? You add life to them by dreaming about them? By dreaming that they died. Talk about someone who's alive? Yes. Someone who's alive, and if you dream about their death, you add life to them. No. Yes. No, you never heard that? No. Okay. No. What I would generally, if, again, if it's someone who's sick and you're concerned and you're worried, I would say, okay, well, I know that's not true. It's just detaching my fears and concerns and thoughts of the day. And this is, this is Hashem's helping me, like, get rid of this negativity. So it's actually very good. And thank you, Hashem. And if it's like very random and you're like, oh, in the world, I think of that person dying, or it's very scary. Why did I think of that person dying? So death also has the interpretation, our sages, of like leaving their current stature and going to a higher position. Like it says in Perkeavos, we go through the stages of life when you're five and 10 and 15 and 20 and 30 and 40 and 50 and 60 and 70, 80 and 90, and you're 100. This is 100. It's as if you're dead and left this world. It's like, what? I mean, being alive at 100 is a beautiful blessing. Why is our sage just saying it? It's like it's a negative thing. So it's understood, Hasidic thought. It doesn't mean that they're saying the person should die or the person will die. But death meaning you've achieved so much and have accomplished so much. I've reached such a refinement to live such a long life that now it's like you've come to a completely different stature, a completely higher level. So if you ever see that motif of death in your dreams, you should always have some, you can interpret it for yourself, but have someone interpret it like in Perkyavos. So this is a very legit source of raising to a higher level. Eugenia? Hi. Hi. Wow. Amazing. Okay. On. Wow. <laughs> I'm actually in Israel, so I couldn't fall asleep. Oh, wow. I'm so jet lagged. You, you couldn't fall asleep. So you're learning about yeah, dreams. Exactly. Ah, and the Yes. Beautiful. So I, um, it's funny you say that because I've been told that if you dream about someone who passes away, that means they're going to have a long life. So you're saying it's not true. I don't think it's true. I think it's probably what someone gave as a dream interpretation. And as such, you could use it and it could be true. Meaning in the Gemara, when we list, oh my gosh over a hundred signs of dreams and what this means and what this means and what this means, it's not written there. So I would assume what happened is sort of like what we're saying, that someone had the scary dream about someone dying and they went to someone to interpret it and this is what the person told them. And maybe many people have done that because obviously you wanna interpret it for good. So it's fine if, if someone comes to you and you give them that interpretation. I, because you know, a long life, they have such a long life, and you could you could echo back Perkyavos, what I said that Perkyavos says a hundred is like you're dead. Well, a very long life. So it's a simon for a long life. It's fine to say it. But I'm saying, is it a is it like a symbol like I would say without the interpretation? Oh, I know what this means. This means long life. No, there are certain things. Oh, I know what that means. Yeah, Kabbalah speaks about it, Gemara speaks about it. I I, I don't believe so. But I definitely do know, because I'm saying this isn't Perkeavos, that death, the death talking about with that person who's 100 is actually a person who has so elevated himself. He's like going to a whole new stature. So we could view death as a sign that the person's going to ascend to a totally higher, newer plane as if he has a new life, as if he's left this life and gone to a much higher life as Perkyavos speaks of death. Okay. Now, my next question is, 
Um, let's say who, someone who's passed away comes in your dream um, and tries to send you a message and that message comes true. Is it, do they, do these nishamas get like permission to come in your dream? Yes. To send 100%, the message? Okay. 100%. And that is true. And that we, we we're going to speak about when we speak about the positive dreams. Now to have a message is very special. I don't know if I would say it's rare. Uh, often the message, the message is often the most common time. I don't want to say often. The most common time someone's coming and giving a true message is very often after, right after someone passes away because they might have some unfinished business, some need that they want you to take care of. And therefore they're giving you a message to help them by doing this, that, or the other. If what you mean by the message is more like telling you something in the future that they want you to know, or that's beneficial for you to know, or when it happens, you should interpret it a certain way, that would just be their merit or your merit or the combination that they came to to give you that message. Most commonly, when someone you know and love passed away and they come to you in your dream, they're coming to you to give you a general message that I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm still connected to you. I still love you. Don't worry about me. I'm okay. And many, many, many people I even had, I mean, I mean, this sounds, you know, like I've had many people share with me many, many stories of their dreams where, you know, most unbelievable things people have dreams of conveying that message. Interesting. Okay. Now one more question. Sorry. Um, is there, is there a message that comes with a dream? Let's say someone who's passed away, they come in your dream. Um, sometimes there's been many times where they show up, but they don't speak a word. And there's been times where they actually have a conversation conversation. Um, is there, is there a specific message that comes with that? Like, let's say if, you know, one time they do speak, um, and one time they don't. You're saying, am I supposed to find a message? Well, sometimes what happens, there are stories of sometimes where someone will come to you multiple times to give you a message. And it's possible that some of the times they don't speak because by their very being they sort of conveyed a message that you didn't get so then they or they or you chose not to listen to so they come again and they come again and then maybe finally they're given permission to speak or conversely they might come and speak and then you didn't listen you didn't take it seriously so they're going to come again and they don't even sometimes have to say anything they're just there and it's a sign i already gave you this message you know there's um famous stories you know written down i don't mean stories like not true stories you know, things are written down of um, people having such experiences where someone could come to them multiple times because they're not listening to the message. So they're, and sometimes they don't have to say anything because they already gave the message or they're conveying the message. So yes, that's definitely, definitely true. I'm thinking right now of two, you know, very legit sources I've, I've learned of, of exactly that concept where they, someone doesn't want to hear the message, doesn't believe in the message, is rejecting the message. So the person comes multiple times for them to get the message. Absolutely, absolutely. It's interesting because even if they don't say anything, sometimes their very being could be conveying to a message. Right. Um, I, I actually had a dream, uh, I want to say about, maybe four months ago, five months ago, my sister-in-law, my brother's wife's uh, father passed away. Um, he, they just had his uh, first yard site. Um, he came to me in a dream. Um, I was walking by and uh, he was standing there in a tuxedo. And uh, I told him, how are you here? You passed away. And he, he said, I'm okay, I'm okay. And he kept smiling at me. And when I told my sister-in-law about the dream, uh, she said, you know, I, I've been praying for him to come to me in my dream just to let me know he's okay. Um, 
And actually, a few months ago, her her youngest sister, um, who was divorced, just got engaged. Um, so I'm I'm wondering if th- that was around the same time that they just started dating. Um, and I'm wondering if he came to me in my dream in a in a like a black and white tuxedo, telling me like you know there's a simcha happening. Yes. Um, and exactly when that I when I had it. Right. So when I had the dream, I didn't know that she was dating anyone. And I told my sister-in-law, I said, there's, you know, he's probably coming and telling us that there's going to be a simcha soon in your family. So I don't know. I thought that was something nice. That yes. yes. And it's, it's nice. You were chosen to be the vehicle for him instead of like his own daughter. Right. I, I was very surprised he came to me. <laughs> you but, know what? Um, Sometimes it's interesting. And I have two understandings I can share with you why I would think that. One is sometimes it might be too overwhelming, too intense to come to their child and therefore they're going to come mm. to the house. Mm. And sometimes that you just, just your energy could be more open to these things. Some people are just more open to this and therefore they can be more a vehicle. It's more natural for them to be a vehicle. And some other people are just more, their energy just doesn't flow the same way with it. So therefore they're not a vehicle. Not, it doesn't mean they're you're holier or less, it's, you know, more meritorious, less meritorious. It's just like your soul's nature. So some people are just more open. I find people that are open have a lot of these types of dreams because or, or things like this. They're just like open to this type of energy and therefore they experience it a lot. Um, so it could be you're more open or it could be for whatever reason, it, it for whatever reason, whatever godly calculations, he couldn't, he, maybe he didn't have the merit of directly sharing this with his daughter. Maybe it had to come through someone else. A very interesting thing. Last summer, a close friend of mine passed away very suddenly, very suddenly, literally like her husband came home and she was gone. And, um, and I came to the Shiva multiple times. This was someone I, I felt very close to. And I, I went many, many times to the Shiva house. Now, one of the times, you know, we were talking, it was late at night. And I said to the, she's many children. I said to the children, what was the most comforting thing for the whole Shiva? And they shared with me that a woman in our community, a woman who was not, I mean, not enemies, but not friends with this woman, you know, didn't have to be a friend. Nice woman, didn't have to be a friend. She came to the Shiva and she, and a very like, how should I put it? very like down to earth, practical type of person, not an airy fairy flying spiritual type, like very nice, very grounded. She said last night, I had a dream. This is what the woman said to the children when she came to be Menachem Mabel by the Shiva. She said, I had a dream. She said, I've never been into your house. She said, I've never, you know, never happened to come to your house. She said, I came into your house, like I was being to Menachem Mabel. And I came into this room and I dreamed this room. I saw this exact room in my dream. And I saw all of you sitting here. I don't know exactly who the kids are. I saw all of you sitting here and I saw your mother and I saw your mother going to each one of you and talking to you and giving you brachas and giving you comfort. And I saw her, I saw her. She went to each one of you and they knew the truth of that vision because this woman never knew how she didn't know them so well. She didn't know their house at all. So why did my friend choose to go to her and not to like someone she was more close to or anybody like that? And I think it was exactly because this woman was the best conduit for them to know the truth of it. So someone who she was, a nice woman, she's not especially close to and never been to her house and didn't know her kids. And when she says it, they'll know it's for real. So sometimes someone comes not to a person that they're closest to for, again, whatever various reason or like perhaps in your case, because maybe that person is more open to this energy and therefore it's easier to, to do that. Right. So do these neshamas get an option as to who they come to, to send a message? I would think so. I would think so. I, meaning I think there was a choice, but again, maybe for factors that we don't know about, they couldn't come to their child. So therefore they had to choose someone else. In other words, it's not necessarily that they're saying, I don't want to go to my child. Maybe they couldn't for whatever reason. Maybe that road was blocked, but then they chose a different road. Hmm. Okay, interesting. And one more thing. Is is there supposed to be a special special message um, when someone who's passed away uh, comes to you in a dream right before a simcha? Let's say you're having a simcha. Um, 
I and would, they I come would, to I you. I would interpret it as they're telling you, they're with you, they're there, they're going to be there at the same time. Mm, That's a hundred percent how I would interpret that. They're telling you they're there. Many people have the custom, like for a wedding, to go to the kever, to go to the gravesite right. and put down an invitation. Right. Not that everyone does that, but that's generally something. It's, it is a Jewish thought. It is a thing that Jews do. And um, we're inviting them and we know they're coming. It says for any life cycle event, three generations come, meaning the parents, grandparents, and great grandparents come. So for a chuppah, you know, the chassan and kala, their parents are going to be there, their grandparents are going to be there, their great grandparents are going to be there. By a brismila, by a bar mitzvah, bat mitzvah, you know they're coming. If we put the invitation down or not, they know they're they're wanted, and we know they come. So I would definitely, definitely view that as I'm saying, "Don't worry, I'm going to be there." Mm -hmm. I had a very, very special experience myself, probably shared by my one of my sons' bar mitzvahs. Gosh, I have a lot of sons. It's my was my third son's bar mitzvah. So not my first son's bar mitzvah and not my second, who's named after my father, but my third son's bar mitzvah, I was watching the men dancing and I was very clear that I was watching the men dancing and I was watching my husband and my father-in-law dancing together, just the two of them. And I was just watching and oh, it's so nice. It's so sweet. And then I just looked and I saw my father and I saw he was dancing with them. I saw him dancing. And then I turned to my mother who was standing right next to me and I'm like, look, mommy, there's daddy. And I look back and I couldn't see him anymore. But I knew I saw him. I knew he was there. And I knew that I merited to see him just as that he wanted me to know he was there. He was there. So I would definitely, definitely interpret that as I'm with you. Don't worry. I'm going to be at the wedding. I'm going to be at the bar bath mitzvah. I'm going to be at the bris. I'm, you know, I think especially now that we're so close to Mashiach, so the veils are thinner. And I think that's why people have so many so many people have had so many experiences and it's just like unbelievable like why how, how are we being flooded by this awareness now and i think it's because you know the dead are coming back soon you know sheikh is happening so i think that's why we get a lot of messages more so than i think ever before aliza did you have a question i do um, would you go back to where you, you said that the reason that we are more susceptible to dreams that might seem scary is because most of our neshama has left us. Yes. So on, on the flip side here, a lot of this discussion has been about the ability and openness of people who are no longer living in this transmigration coming to us and and that we interpret all of this for the good uh, how do we reconcile that that on the one hand it's like most of our neshama is not here yet so then who are they coming to who are we having the, these visits with in our dreams so to speak well it doesn't mean they, that you're no no it doesn't mean that you're neshama it doesn't mean you don't have a shaman inside of you. you didn't have a shaman inside of you you'd, you'd be dead so you definitely have neshama inside of you so it's not like who are they coming to they're coming to you you have neshama you are you are you there's two dimensions to a dream i was in my very organized lecture first discussing dreams of negative consequence and all that whole discussion and then i was going to go to positive <laughs> eugenia jumped in and she had a question so i did what maybe i shouldn't do but often do what i'm teaching and probably should not do which is just answer the questions and forget the order of my lecture. So I understand the confusion, that's why. So if, if we had taken everything she just said and put in the second half, it would have, it would have processed better in your brain. So what, but the, the, the truth is there's two things, there are two guards that are down when you're sleeping. One is on the negative side, a certain spiritual protection is down because a lot of your soul has left you, again, not left you in a, bad way it's 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 for a good reason to be cleansed to be judged so since the soul matter has left a certain amount of it there's an ability for evil to creep in which is why as i said every night 
when you wake up, you have to wash that Negevasa right away because the evil or toad literally goes out of your body through your fingertips. So this is a literal fact that happens every night. So there's a literal susceptibility to evil because you don't have the protection of the whole soul because it's not there because it's being cleansed and judged. So that, the, that part I get. At the same time, when you're sleeping, also the barriers of your logical mind are gone. Meaning we have our conscious mind and that mind rationalizes things, puts things in rational boxes. You know, if you would see something that makes no sense to you, you know, I don't know if you, you know the famous experiment where they have like, you know, you see this video and there's like dancing bears in it or something or whatever they are. And most people, including myself, when I saw the video, don't see them. You just don't see, you see a whole crowd or whatever, I don't know what it is, whatever's happening in the video. And this piece that makes no sense, you just don't see. Your mind like does processes it away. It can't be, it doesn't exist. Literally, literally. I don't know if you know the experiment I'm talking about, but I, I was shown in some workshop. I saw it and I, I was from the majority that didn't see it. My mind just, you know, didn't process that. So because the guards of our logical mind are up, we're more guarded and therefore not as open to these messages that could come to us from another world. So when I'm sleeping, I don't have the protection of my soul. So I'm more open to the evil. When I'm sleeping, I don't have the rational mind barriers. So therefore, since those rational guards are down, I can absorb messages that maybe by day, I wouldn't be as open to. So both could happen. I'm not saying that one thing is doing both. It could be a bad dream from the first type, the protection of the soul down. It could be a message from the other world, beautiful type, because the barriers of your conscious mind are down. And that's why it could be a foil for either one, but not the same simultaneously. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Sure. That was actually very, good. very good question. Very, very, very good question. All right. So just getting back to what we were saying. Um, um, all right. So protections. I'm trying to remember. We were talking about protections to not have this negative dream. And again, generally a person would take this protection because it's recurring meaning, and definitely I've spoken to many people, you know, over the years that like, oh my gosh, the same really horrible dream keeps coming to them and comes to them. And we look, we try to see if there's anything that could be the magnet for the evil, but there are protections we can do. Um, one very common protection, doesn't hurt to do it every night. It's a good custom is to kiss the mezuzah of your bedroom door. Um, you know, you touch your fingers to the mezuzah and then kiss, that's what we call kissing the mezuzah. Um, before you go to sleep. It's considered a very good act. The shin on the mezuzah is symbolizing Hashem's name of Shin Dalid Yud, which is Shomer Dalsos Yisrael, the guardian of the doors of Israel. And um, the mezuzah protects. So touching the mezuzah like that really helps pull down that protection for you, especially if as you're doing that, you're thinking, you know, protect me, you know, from the night. Um, something else, which I know we've mentioned in this class, in other contexts, is having your final action, speech, and thought be godly. Um, those final actions are very important. They impact the entire night. So therefore, we are told that the final action, ideally, is to actually take I was just mentioning the, what we call negelwasser, a washing basin, a washing cup in a basin filled with water by your bedside to wash your hands ritually right away after you say my da'ani in the morning. So it's very good that that should be the final act. It's a godly act. It's preparing for a mitzvah. The final speech should be Shema and the paragraph of Hamapil, the final paragraph of Kriya Shema um, after which you're not supposed to talk. And the final thought should ideally be something godly that you know by heart. If you say, I don't know anything by heart, you could like think of Shema Yisrael Hashem, okay, Hashem, probably know that by heart, <laughs> or the Aleph phase, and just keep repeating it in your mind until you fall asleep. We know, and modern science now also knows, 
that um, whatever is a final thing we think about cycles in our brain all night. So if you have a godly thought as a final conscious thought before you fell asleep, that tremendously boosts the godliness in the brain. It's in the brain all night as you sleep, circling and circling and circling and circling. And it tremendously protects you from any negative energy. Um, we're told, I guess we'll end on this point. So next week we're gonna talk about the positive dreams completely. Um, sometimes a negative dream could actually be coming by a spiritual negative force, what we refer to as a shin dalit. It's coming to attack you in your sleep. It's coming to bring you to sin, to bring you to sadness, to scare you, to cause you pain. These forces can show you a true painful future or they can make up something. It could be a false painful future. Um, they can't come to you though, unless you're a bit susceptible. Just as I was speaking in the converse in answer to Eugenia's question, that it's possible that she got this vision and not her sister-in-law because maybe she's more open to this type of communication. So in a very, very different way, these Shindalids only can come and attack you. It's an attack. It's not a nice thing. It's an attack. If a person has sinned seriously enough during the day um, to make them susceptible. So if a person did experience something which they did feel or spoke to a rabbi or a Kabbalist or someone that felt it was a Shindalit attack, then definitely it would be very important to do a very sincere repentance for whatever enabled them to be attacked in this fashion, whatever made them so vulnerable, like they were that they were attacked in this fashion. Um, any questions on any of this? Yes, I have a question. Sure. Um, is it true that if you put, um, I think it's either garlic or onion under your bed that, well, I was told this for, for my kids that they won't have nightmares. Is that, is that something true um, or not? I, I never heard, you know what? It sounds like one of those things that I don't know. It might be true. I'll look and see if I can find a source for you. Garlic or onion? Okay. Garlic or nightmares. onion, yes. Prevent nightmares. Okay, so I don't know of a source for that, but I will look and see if I can find one. Okay, thank you. And the, the shindle, is that, is that the, that's not the, like the black cat that has like a seven, like the seven child oh, is black. A shin, a shin dalit is a, it's a negative force. You know, what, 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 what in the, the world they'll call a, a, I mean, they'll use a Christian term for it. It's not even relevant. It is like a negative angel, so to speak. It's a spiritual entity, mm -hmm. but it's an evil spiritual entity. And it has a mission, like every, everything has a mission and it's mission very often is to take over the person, like to possess the person. If you ever heard of any mm -hmm. like Dybbuk stories, that mm -hmm. it's not always a Shindal. It's not always a Shindal. It could be a, a, a Dybbuk is actually not a Shindal. A Dybbuk is a, a wandering soul that takes over a person. So it's not, that's not a Shindal, but similar to the Dybbuk is a concept of the Shindal. And the most common thing for that's a pretty big dramatic thing for a Shindal to literally take over a person. Remember Yael once saying a story that happened with maybe her grandfather was a Kabbalist in Morocco and getting rid of that. You know, I mean, there's, there's definitely many, many stories of that. So not as dramatic, but in the same ballpark is attacking a person in their sleep. And the attacking the sleep comes because the person has this vulnerability to this evil because of some significant transgression they did in the day. It doesn't have to be that day, but that they did and had not repented for. It wouldn't be like, oh, wait, maybe I, you know, so, you know, didn't make a bracha today. That could, no, we're talking about a, I'm not saying that's fine to do. And obviously we want to keep every one of God's laws, but something that we would view as a serious transgression could, could make a person open to that evil and, and vulnerable to that evil. And, and therefore it will be very important to very sincerely repent, to remove that vulnerability, to close that gap. 
that was opened, closed, so they couldn't get in. Any other questions? Is there a way to actually, if the last thing that we're thinking about, you said, then that's, that's what's going to reverberate mm -hmm. throughout mm -hmm. our brain as we're sleeping. And is there a way for us to, if there's something that we, we want or we want settled, for that to be part of our thinking and then for the solution to come to us in our dreams? That's an interesting question. Um, we don't see where that's said is actually in terms of Tyra. It says if a person is struggling with a Tyra question by day and they really sincerely, sincerely, sincerely are trying to understand it by day, an answer could come to them in their dream. That That is written. Right, that I know. So that's so. Much I don't know if it would. Them. Yes, I don't know if it would also work for other things. That I know it does do. But I've never. I don't know. It doesn't hurt to try. But again, definitely wrap it into something holy because very important is you want it to be something of godliness. Thank you. All right. So this was the first part. This was the. Negative dreams, understanding them, understanding the function of, sorry, understanding the function of dreams, understanding negative dreams, how to protect yourself from negative dreams, why a person could have negative dreams, plus answering a few questions. And next week, we'll discuss more at length positive dreams. Thank you so much. All our dreams should always be for good and for blessing. Thank you so much for joining. Amen. Thank you. And I hope you, Jen, you get to sleep. Yes. <laughs> Thank you.